So this is the fourth film in the Rethinking Existentialism series. Um, the series is intended to present a, a, a set of short talks, one on each chapter of my book, Rethinking Existentialism, as I write the book. Um, and this film is on chapter four. And chapter four is on um, the difference between the existentialism uh, that Simone de Beauvoir uh, expounds in 1943 and 1945 and the, and the uh, existentialism that Sartre expounds at, at the same time. Um, so Sartre's existentialism that I'm going to talk about in this film is the view that he summarises in uh, his lecture, Existentialism and Humanism. Existentialism is a humanism that in 1945, and it's essentially the philosophy of being and nothingness, uh, which he published in 1943. Um, Simone de Beauvoir's existentialism I'm going to talk about uh, is, is her view in The Second Sex that was first published uh, in two parts in 1948 and 1949. But I think that the important difference between Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre's earlier form of existentialism is already there in Beauvoir's novel L'Invité, um, which is translated as She Came to Stay. Uh, which was also published in 1943, essentially alongside Being and Nothingness. So I think I mentioned this in an earlier film, although Sartre and Beauvoir um, agree on a lot and they summarise their respective philosophies using the same slogan, existence precedes essence, um, they disagree over exactly what that slogan means. And what this film is about today is um, that disagreement. So I'll start with Sartre, because um, I talked about Sartre's existentialism a lot uh, already in these films. And uh, in the last film, film three, I talked about the uh, um, role of uh, freedom and the role of projects in human existence, according to Sartre's existentialism. And the, the essential idea is this, that um, projects are basically values, right? things that you value and that you, you choose your values. You decide what to value some way uh, and you pursue those values and it's because of those values that you have that the world seems to be structured for you as a set of reasons to behave one way or another right? reasons that invite you to respond in some way or prohibit you responding in another way um, so one of Sartre's examples um, is the signs that tell us to keep off the grass um, and he says that you know those have a meaning, they have a, a socially given meaning and a, and a kind of authoritative structure behind them. The sign has been put there by the person who's in charge of the park, you know, perhaps they can throw you out of the park if you walk on the grass or whatever. But is the sign a reason not to walk on the grass? Well, that depends on your values. That depends on uh, whether you want to obey that or whether you want to stay in the park or, or whatever it is um, that shapes your response to that sign. Otherwise, you know, if you just want to defy authority in every way possible, uh, no matter how petty, then you could take that sign to be a, a reason to stride across the lawn. Um, so that's supposed to summarise a, a deeper point, that's a fairly trivial example, obviously, that all of the reasons that we find in our experience are essentially grounded in our own values in that way. Um, now, I think Simone de Beauvoir agrees with that and is going to agree with everything I've said so far. Um, but here's where they differ. Um, for Sartre, the projects that you pursue, the values that you have, can be changed at any time. He even thinks that that can happen without, any, without you having any particular reason to do it. But we don't need to worry about that further claim. The important claim now is that... Um, that projects don't, or values don't have any kind of weight of their own. They don't have any inertia of their own. They don't um, uh, carry any force uh, except the force that you give them. It's only because you continue to underwrite those values. You effectively, in his language, continue to choose them. You continue to endorse them that, um, that they structure your experience in this way and that you carry on pursuing them. And that if you uh, wanted to change those values, you just could. Um, 
Uh, and Sartre uses the word conversion. In fact, sometimes he calls it radical conversion. Um, radical meaning, uh, you know, at the roots. So if you could convert uh, yourself to a, a new outlook in life, right at the very core, right at the very roots of your uh, understanding of, of what's important right, and your engagement with the world, you could just change your outlook. Now, Simone de Beauvoir has a very different view of how one's outlook um, uh, is formed in a way, but, but more importantly, um, she has a very different view of the force or weight or inertia that your own outlook then carries for you. And I think this is most clear in, in, in The Second Sex, right? Because uh, especially book two of The Second Sex, um, which begins with that famous line uh, that one is not born a woman but becomes one, um, uh, Beauvoir dedicates a, a, a lot of attention and a lot of analysis to the kind of social conditioning that shapes gender. Um, she puts her emphasis on the way in which uh, social conditioning shapes uh, femininity, or the feminine uh, character, as she sometimes calls it. Um, but actually everything she says, and she's aware of this, and she points this out at various uh, moments, um, applies uh, in, in parallel right, uh, uh, to the way in which uh, masculinity is formed as well, to the way in which uh, uh, men, you know, if, if it's not only true that one is not born a woman but becomes one, it's also true that one is not born a man but becomes one uh, on both one's picture. It's just that's not the focus of her discussion. So what is the focus of her discussion? Well, she talks about the, the, the differences in the ways in which boys and girls are raised as children right from early infancy up through childhood, through teenage and adolescence. Uh, and she talks about the continuing social pressures on adults to conform to particular uh, gender roles, to have particular values, to um, have particular attitudes. The kind of pressure she uh, uh, talks about is, I think, pretty evident in our everyday experience, to be honest. Um, it's, uh, it's about the kind of things for which you get praised, the kind of things for which you get uh, admonished. Um, uh, and the kind of opportunities that are open to you and the kind of opportunities you're encouraged to pursue and the ones you're discouraged from pursuing and so on and so forth. Um, now, all of that stuff obviously is going to shape the kinds of skills that an individual develops and it might shape the kind of interests that they develop and it might shape the kind of uh, abilities, just bodily abilities that they develop. But Beauvoir thinks that all of that is true, but she also thinks that it uh, ultimately is going to shape the kind of values and the kind of attitudes uh, and the kind of personal goals that individuals have. Um, so, and, and, and that that's the point of it, actually. It's not just to, to train boys and girls into being able to pursue different roles in life. It's also um, to, uh, to, to make them want to and to, to instill those values in them. Um, and that's of course part of her explanation of how gender gets perpetuated because um, once those children have grown up, the fact that they have those values instilled in them is what explains why they then uh, um, condition the next generation in the same way. Right. Um, now, everything I've said so far in principle could be agreed by Sartre, right? But on Sartre's view, it would have to be the case that, you know, once you come to realise that as an adult, uh, or whenever you come to realise it, you can simply overthrow all those values that have been instilled in you and start again with your own values, with no, with no trouble, right? That, that would be the, a radical conversion. Right? But Beauvoir thinks that that's unrealistic. Um, and I think this is uh, why her uh, philosophy of gender is more subtle, actually, than, than it's sometimes given credit for. Um, so she's sometimes portrayed as somebody who thinks that um, uh, women are to blame right, for being in a, in a subordinate role in society uh, because, you know, they could just throw off those values and you know, adopt a new set of values and, and live a different kind of life. That, that's not actually what she says in The Second Sex. She says um, that that kind of social conditioning you know, is deeply sedimented in the individual's outlook. Uh, the person who's been conditioned in that way doesn't necessarily see that there are other options, 
um, or, or the other kind of uh, values or other kind of outlooks or lifestyles are really even uh, available to them because they might genuinely believe that as a woman uh, one simply can't uh, live in other ways that, that would be uh, you know, untrue to to what it is to be the kind of person you are um, and I think she well she also says that uh, in cases and I guess she's partly talking autobiographically here though she doesn't explicitly say so she says that in cases where um, a, a woman has rejected the kind of femininity that they've been conditioned into and they have uh, rejected the idea that they should have these particular kinds of values and subordinate themselves to men and and uh, and care only about you know, marrying well and having children and raising children and not have any other ambitions outside of that and only care about harmony and keeping the peace and not about personal ambitions and, and all of that kind of um, conditioning of femininity she says even even a woman who's rejected all that uh, perhaps like herself uh, and even if they're in a position an economic position to have rejected all that so they don't need um, to be to be economically dependent on men um, so they so they can reject uh, the, the feminine condition as she calls it even then she says the 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 the, the, the effect of all that conditioning through upbringing it doesn't just disappear just because they've rejected it Right? It still shapes their outlook in some ways, in ways that they reject, but it still influences them in ways that they might not realise it's influencing them. So they might wonder why they, they want particular things and wish they didn't, but they still do. Um, and so what she talks about here, she doesn't, although having said all that, she doesn't think that um, um, this conditioning leaves you with a character that is fixed. You know, set in stone for all eternity. She thinks that it is possible to remove those values. It is possible um, to uh, become a very different person and to thoroughly change your outlook. It's just that she rejects this idea, this Sartrean idea, that you can do it just by decision, right? just by conversion, just by uh, deciding that's that's what you want to do. Um, and the word she uses instead is metamorphosis, and I think that's a really nice image. Um, so it's a uh, it's um, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. It's a slow process um, of kind of recalibrating and um, re-sedimenting uh, new values. Uh, changing your outlook um, involves um, a kind of retraining, or, or you might call it counter-conditioning. Right? Now, what's going on there? Well, it's the, the difference between Sartre and Beauvoir here is simply that um, Beauvoir thinks uh, believes in what I've been occasionally referring to here as sedimentation. Right? Um, that's what Merleau Ponty uses for this as well. I'll, I'll come back to Merleau Ponty probably by the end of the talk. Um, that is that Beauvoir thinks that the longer that you act on a particular value, the more you reaffirm it in your action uh, and in your attitudes and in your thought. Um, the, the more it sediments, the more deeply ingrained or deeply embedded it becomes into your cognitive system. So the more um, it shapes your outlook, uh, the more influence it has over your uh, over your outlook, and the harder it is to remove it, the more counter conditioning it would take to, to kind of wear it away again. Um, that's her view, and that I think is partly motivated um, by, the, by, by her interest in explaining how gender happens, how it can be that if, you know, if we're all just um, the same kind of human existent as in some sense we are on the existentialist picture, how, do you, how, how does it come about that you have noticeably different gender characteristics? And this is her explanation, it's social conditioning, but it's social conditioning which becomes embedded, becomes sedimented uh, in a way that is not possible on Sartre's picture. Right? Because it, on Sartre's picture, um, uh, projects, values don't carry any weight apart from the weight that you give them. Their only force is that you endorse them. On Beauvoir's picture, that's not where their force comes from. Their force comes from their being sedimented, and it's a matter of degree. And even if you no longer endorse them, those values, uh, once sedimented, will continue to exert that force for quite some time until... Um, until that, that has been worn away.
as I said. Now, what I've talked about so far, of course, is the second sex, and the second sex is published, as I said, um, uh, in two parts, 1948-1949. Um, so the fact that Beauvoir thinks that at the end of the 40s and Sartre thinks something different at the start of the 40s doesn't tell us much about whether they disagreed earlier at the start of the 40s, right? whether they disagreed at the time of the existentialist offensive in 1945 when they published lots and lots of articles and gave lots of talks and, and, uh, and generally tried to um, launch existentialism as a, as a cultural movement to help shape the, the, uh, the rebuilding of France after the war. Um, but I think that there's, I think that once you see that role of conditioning um, and sedimentation in the second sex, I think it becomes very clear that, that, that the same idea is what's driving uh, Beauvoir's novel of 1943, um, La Vite, or She Came to Stay. Um, so just a kind of quick summary of the novel. I don't want to spoil it if you haven't read it. Um, uh, the two central characters are a couple called Pierre and Françoise who work in the theatre and uh, and uh, are very committed to their values of of creating um, art and 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 uh, and communicating their ideas through theatre and they're very clearly modelled um, to some extent on Sartre and Beauvoir themselves and into their relationship there comes a younger woman so Pierre and Françoise are in their thirties I think and, and then along comes this younger woman Xavier uh, who is um, I think in her late teens or early twenties and she has a very different attitude towards life um, she is in some ways quite nihilistic she just doesn't think anything really matters and uh, she pokes fun at Pierre and Françoise who's you know who have dedicated themselves to this supposedly bohemian lifestyle in order to you know escape the boredom of a kind of more ordinary life whereas Xavier thinks well actually their life's pretty boring they they all they work around the clock um, and they and they just uh, they just committed uh, and dedicated to their projects in the same way as a bank manager or a, or a traffic warden um, it's just that they're different projects so Xavier sort of represents a kind of nihilism she thinks that nothing really matters and and um, and, and refuses to take seriously the, the values that Pierre and Francoise have have built their lives on now in some ways that seems absolutely fine for Xavier right she's right at the start of her adult life she's you know the, the world is her oyster she she has yet to decide what she's going to do she's not yet committed to anything in particular so there are no particular values or goals that have become sedimented into her outlook that she takes seriously and that shapes her view as a result of having acted on them, at least not goals and values that are her own, that are her own um, uh, aims in life. The trouble and the, and the drama of the novel is driven by the different attitudes towards Xavier had by Pierre and Françoise, right? So Françoise wants to wants to teach Xavier that actually, you know, this um, this life of the theatre and uh, and of intellectual analysis um, of uh, cultural and political events is a, is a good life to lead, and she wants to kind of bring her into their project and bring her into into their world and and uh, and uh, take her under under her wing, as it were. And that's what Françoise wants, uh, but Pierre. Pierre um, is more uh, infatuated, really, with Xavier's frivolous outlook. So Pierre takes it quite seriously, the thought that actually Xavier might be right, that it, um, none of this stuff really matters after all. Um, and it's that tension between Françoise's commitment to the shared values uh, of the project that Pierre and Françoise have been pursuing together for over a decade uh, and Pierre's kind of um, uh, taking seriously the idea that those values don't matter, that tension is what drives the novel, I think. Um, it's what explains why Françoise becomes really quite ill and then why uh, uh, Françoise resolves the situation in the uh, somewhat melodramatic way that she does. Um, you'll have to read the novel if you want to know what that is. Um, so what's going on there? I think it's this. I think that 
Francoise can't take seriously, literally can't take seriously, um, the idea that her values are unimportant. And she can understand that idea, she can see uh, what Xavier is getting at, and she could even entertain the thought that Xavier might be right, but she can't really seriously begin to think it. Why? Because the values that she's built her life around have become so deeply sedimented that they shape her outlook, right? She's just very committed to those values because she's been acting on them and pursuing them uh, for over a decade, right? and that's sedimentation. Pierre, on the other hand, does take Xavier's ideas quite seriously and begins to think that perhaps she's absolutely right. And that reveals to Francoise, I think, not just that Pierre is no longer very committed to their project, but really that he never was. Because if he had been over the past 10 years, then those values would have become so sedimented in his outlook that he wouldn't be able to take Xavier seriously. He would just think, well, you know, what, what Francoise thinks, which is that Xavier is, um, is, has a, a, a frivolous outlook because she hasn't yet become committed to anything in, in her adult life. Instead, um, Pierre thinks that Xavier might be right because it seems he hasn't become really committed to anything in his adult life. And that is what drives Francoise's problem, that she's built her life around a shared commitment, a shared project, and now begins to discover um, and I think she discovers it before she realises that's what she's discovered. Um, uh, what she begins to discover is that it's not a shared project at all, um, even though she always thought it was, that Pierre was never that committed to it at all, even though she was. So that, I think, is... Well, that's why I say that uh, uh, Sartre and Beauvoir already disagreed in 1943. That idea of sedimentation that drives the second sex uh, also drives uh, L'Invité, She Came to Stay, which is published in 1943. There's something quite nice about this too, right? Um, as I said, Pierre and Francoise are modelled on Sartre and Beauvoir. If you read She Came to Stay as, a, as expounding this idea of sedimentation of values, then of course it stands as a criticism of Sartre's existentialism, which is published in the same year in Being and Nothingness. So the tension between Francoise and Pierre, that Francoise is committed to values that become sedimented and Pierre isn't, um, kind of allegorically dramatises the philosophical disagreement between Beauvoir and Sartre. She believes in sedimentation, he doesn't. Um, so that's why I say they disagree right at the start, right at the start of the existentialist offensive in 1945. I mean, they disagreed in 1943. Um, I said I'd come back to Merleau-Ponty as well. This idea of sedimentation is often associated with Merleau-Ponty. It's a very important idea in his uh, book, Phenomenology of Perception, in 1945, uh, where he, uh, which I talked about in the last film. But I think that for Merleau-Ponty, sedimentation is primarily about knowledge and understanding of the environment. And it's only at the end of the book where he sort of throws in this extra idea that your, your motivations, your values, your attitudes might also become sedimented or, or be subject to something like sedimentation, he says. Um, and that's a kind of afterthought, uh, and it's an application of his idea of the sedimentation of, of knowledge and, and, and social meanings to, to motivations. I, for Beauvoir, I think it's completely the other way around. What becomes sedimented primarily are your values, are your projects, and any kind of social meanings and social outlooks uh, and skills and other things that become sedimented uh, do so as a result of their being involved in the pursuit of your projects. So for that reason, I think Beauvoir is still an existentialist. She thinks projects come first, values come first. That's what explains everything about your behaviour. Right? Um, even the sedimented social meanings like gender um, come about because uh, you have the project that you want to please people and you want to be praised and you don't want to be do things that you're discouraged from doing and that's why you end up um, uh, 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 being conditioned in the way that you are through childhood. Um, and she remains an existentialist in that she thinks that that sedimentation can be overcome so she does agree that the values that you pursue can be changed and new projects can be adopted in their place. Um, it's just that she thinks that that can't be done by conversion, it can only be done by metamorphosis. Right.
So that's the crucial difference between um, Sartre and Beauvoir in um, the early 1940s. That's the crucial difference between their forms of existentialism. Uh, I think in the next film, I'm going to tell you a bit about what difference that makes, why they have or how they have different forms of um, psychoanalysis that they ground in their different kinds of existentialism um, and, and why the difference there in their psychoanalysis is based on this difference between conversion and metamorphosis.